Everybody's heard it. Most people have said it, and a lot don't even realize that its origin is from the Bible. It's this common statement that actually is a Bible verse that says, Judge not, lest you be judged. There's a lot of misunderstandings about this, and oftentimes when there's a dispute or when somebody doesn't agree with someone else's character or an action that they made, or when somebody points out something that's wrong, one of the first statements that you'll see, especially on social media, is, we're not supposed to judge. Well, what does that really mean? Yes, the Bible does say that, and since it does originate from the Bible, we're going to look at it from a biblical perspective. Judgment. What does it mean? What does it not mean? Well, first and foremost, let's look at what does judgment mean. Right now, I'm in a courtroom. I'm actually sitting in a jury box where a group of 6 to 12 jurors would sit, and they would assess a case, and based on the facts of that case and the rules of the land, they would make an assessment, assessment of guilt or innocent, and also an assessment of punishment. Of course, there would be a judge sitting across from me who would also be listening to this entire drama unfold, and decisions would be made. Judgments would be executed. So what does the Bible mean when it says, judge not lest you be judged? Well, first of all, it means that we are never to criticize or condemn someone. When a person is judging another person from the means of attacking them or maybe trying to bring them down to make themselves look better, that's always wrong. This was one of the problems with the Pharisees. It wasn't a matter of them wanting to help people. It wasn't even a matter oftentimes of them wanting to do what was legal or what was right. It was a means by them tearing people down. It was a means by which they were trying to mold people into thinking and believing and even accepting their own ideas and traditions. So it means that first and foremost, you never criticize or condemn other people. A lot of that is based on motive. The second thing that, the, that the, we learn from this terminology of don't judge lest you be judged, it's a statement that means, in essence, don't go around trying to sweep around somebody else's front door until you first sweeped around your own. How easy it is for us to make judgments on other people and evaluate them without first looking in the mirror and finding out those things that are wrong in our own life. This verse also means that sometimes we are to confront other people. That can be a precautionary measure. I think about my own kids when I have to judge certain situations and I have to warn them of potential danger or consequence. Um, it means that sometimes that not only as a precautionary measure, but simply because something is wrong or right. I have to make decisions every day that make me evaluate certain circumstances and in some cases, confront people because of doing something that would be illegal or immoral. But this is extremely important. You see, the Bible says that if we are going to confront other people, to try to protect them, to try to help them, of course, should be our ultimate goal. But if we're going to do that, we've got to always be careful that we realize that we could end up falling into some of the same traps and sins that they have fallen into. We must be so careful about confronting other people. Because many times, the faults that we see in other people oftentimes are some of the things that we have in our own life. You see, the biggest hypocrites in the world are people who point out the faults of others and they themselves are guilty of doing the exact same things. People may forget what you say. They may forget what you did. But they'll never forget the way you made them feel. It's so important that any time that we're discussing. And I think recently about social media, there's so many debates going on. And it turns into these vitriolic arguments where people are attacking one another. You see, we've got to approach every situation with compassion and with mercy. This is something that you see in the life of Jesus. One of the things that I love the most about him. I think about when he confronted the lady that had been caught in adultery or the woman that had numerous husbands. You don't see him coming across in a condescending judgmental, hateful way. No, he confronted what was wrong. He even pointed out what, what was wrong. But he did it in a way that showed love and compassion. At the end of the day, that's what every single one of us are looking for. And last but not least, 
It also means that we are never to judge situations or people based on self-imposed standards. This was another fault of the Pharisees. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 23 when he said, You're like a whitewashed tomb. He said, Outwardly you appear clean, but inside you're full of dead men's bones and everything that's wrong. He went on to say that they were actually like a tomb, which outwardly was beautiful, but inside was full of death. So we should never approach things from our own self-imposed standards. I think about when I first met Christ at 21 years of age. We started a street witnessing team. And so we would often be seen outside of some of the bars downtown and some of the peep shows and some of the strip clubs. And there were some people who did not understand exactly what we were doing. And they were making evaluations and decisions based on incorrect information. I think about times where I've heard people attack other people because they listened to a different genre of music or they went to a certain movie. We cannot take our traditions or our standards and impose them on other people. So we've talked about what this verse and what this saying does mean. We got to look at also what it does not mean. It does not mean that as followers of Christ that we are not to make an evaluation or determination about false teachings. There are so many things in this day and age that are considered truth that are not biblically true at all. Some of them are even innocent sayings. I remember as a kid when I was growing up, my grandmother would say, God helps those who help themselves. I spent my whole life thinking that must be a Bible verse. And there may be some truth to the statement about the importance of doing what you should be doing, but it's certainly not a Bible statement. And so as believers, we have the right to make determinations and evaluations about teachings that are incorrect, especially in a day when there are so many teachings that are false. It also means that believers do have the right to confront actions that are incorrect. As I said earlier, I'm standing in a courtroom. The whole process of this courtroom is to set what's wrong and make it right, to make decisions about maybe inadvertent or intentional mistakes that people have made. Because we know that for every decision made, there is a positive or negative consequence. So believers do have the right to make evaluations. Again, we have to remember that this whole concept of judgment doesn't mean attacking somebody or trying to prove how wrong they are and how right we are. But we do have the right to make evaluations based on their actions, the way they live their life. Even Jesus said in Matthew 7, 20, by their fruits, you shall know them. In other words, he said, you can even look at a tree and you could tell what type of tree that it was based on the fruit that it produced. The same thing is correct in your life or mine. People that really know me and have spent time around me, they can tell what kind of man I am by the way that I live my life. It also means that as followers of Christ, we have the right to, and we are actually supposed to make evaluations and judgments about what is moral and what is immoral. It seems as in the United States right now, what really is right is considered wrong. And many things that are considered wrong are now considered right. It's not based on my opinion or someone else's. For those of us that are believers, we have to make these determinations, these judgments, based on the ultimate authority. And that ultimate authority is nothing more or nothing less than what God says about it. My op opinion about something really is completely irrelevant. And it also means that as believers, we are to judge and we are to evaluate the character of other people. Now, again, we have to put this in proper context, not in the sense so that we can alienate people or so we can ostracize them. But I think about my own kids. I uh, have to make judgments based on some of the people they hang around with, what's good for them or, or, or what's bad for them. It's something that we are supposed to do and something that we should do. Uh, a verse comes to mind even in Proverbs 13, 20, that it says, He that walks with wise men will be wise, but a person who has a companion of fools will be destroyed. So those are some lessons about what judgment does mean and what it doesn't mean from a biblical perspective. At the end of the day, it all boils down to, in many cases, outside of what God says is right and what says is wrong, is how we approach people. What is the motive behind our confronting a situation? 
Yes, there are moral absolutes. Now, that's something that uh, is not very popular in today's society. We, we want to tear down all the barriers. We want to break down all the parameters. And some people say, well, every man has the right to determine what's right in his own eyes. But that leads to a lawless society. Some even say that it's unfair to say that something is wrong based on your own convictions. But yet, that's a ludicrous statement as well. Would we not all agree that Hitler is evil? Would we not all agree that murder is wrong? But there are moral absolutes. Always has been, always will be. The truth of it is, as I said early, earlier in the jury box, I'm ashamed to say there's been many times I have said in that jury box and I have unfairly judged other people. I can also say that... Um, I've also been not only in the place of the jury box and the judge, but I've also sit in the place of a person who's a defendant, a person who has been wrongly accused of something or blamed for something that I really didn't even do. Judge not, so you be not judged. Yes and no. I got to judge every day, but why are we doing it? And what's the motive behind it? You see, we have got to take a stand at some point. And again, the stand's got to be based on God's Word. One of the things that I absolutely love about Jesus is the way that He interacted with sinners. That's right, people just like you and just like me. Uh, Luke 5.32, Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but I came to call sinners unto repentance. It was Jesus' way of saying, I really did not come for those self-righteous, hypocritical, religious people that think they're better than anybody else. No, I came for the lost. I came for the hurting. I came for the broken. And I came for the down. Jesus had such a great compassion for hurting people. And anytime you look through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, you will see that his interaction with people who are sinners and who are broken and his interactions with the Pharisees are diametrically different. The sinners, the broken down people, the ones who were hurting, the ones who had made all the big mistakes, there was such a compassion there. Yes, Jesus made judgments, but you never saw him attacking people. It was never criticizing. It was never meant in a, in a mean-spirited way. Yes, he did confront what they did wrong, he told the woman who had multiple husbands, go and sin no more. But it was so much different than the Pharisees when he had interaction with them. And by the way, let's not forget that it was the Pharisees that were the ones who falsely arrested Jesus. It was the religious people who stood before the, the governor of the day who had the right to dismiss Jesus' charges or to enforce them. Remember, it was the religious leaders that began to scream at the top of their lungs, crucify Him, crucify Him. Yeah, the interactions were completely different. You see, Jesus runs to sinful people. Some of the people that you and I might run away from are the very people that Jesus is running to. You say, well, Jay, what, how does that fit into this whole lesson on judgment? Because it's us trying to emulate and behave the same way that He behaved when He encountered hurting people. It wasn't this higher than, even though He was better than everybody else, He didn't act like it. Even though He knew more than anybody else, He didn't act like it. No, He came to them with compassion and with love and with sensitivity. And that's exactly the way that you and I are supposed to be. Yeah, we've got to take a stand. We cannot call wrong right. I would rather be divided by truth than united by error any single day of my life. So it's not a matter of not taking a stand, but it's how you take it. My mom used to always say to me, Jay, it's not what you say, but it's how you say it. Yes, there are plenty of moral absolutes, and God has set up parameters. And by the way, He didn't set up those parameters so that your life and my life could be boring. He set up those parameters for the same reason that I set them up with my own kids, to protect them. And it's because I love them. In a day when really we have courtrooms every single day all across the land. I don't mean just a literal courtroom like the one that I'm standing in. The courtroom of Facebook. The courtroom of Twitter. The courtroom of the locker room talk. The courtroom of 
at the office and at the job and at the school. Yeah, there's plenty of judgment being done. But we've got to be looking in our own lives. And we've got to realize that we've got to approach judgment from a biblical perspective. Most importantly, we've got to be like Jesus. A person who loved and a person who was a friend of sinners. Thank God for that. Because had he not have been, I would have never had any opportunity for forgiveness. And neither would you.